How could the king ask me to make a promise he knew I could not keep? Was it possible for me to declare that I should no longer wish to write to my family or see my brother if he returned to France? Louis was master of my fate. He could take steps to prevent me from doing these things, but he could not make me consent to his doing so. In spite of this, I was forced to submit to all the emperor's reproaches when he received the letter in which my husband complained that I was making him miserable. The king was ill for two days. I did not leave aside for a moment. He must have noticed my spontaneous and zealous care. He seemed to be touched by it, but his first expression of tenderness revealed again a desire to find me at fault. The fact that he was unable to do this seemed to embitter him, and I felt he was saying to himself, how I could love you and how happy I would be if only you were guilty. I was extremely discouraged. All hope of happiness had fled. Thinking to make someone else happy, I still persisted in my attempts to achieve this purpose. How many times have I stifled a complaint or a sigh in order not to shame the man to whom I vowed obedience? I so wanted to make him happy in spite of his natural melancholy. I struggled to modify his nature, and I fed my foolish hopes on my incessant and constantly vain efforts. It was as though I considered that I possessed more than human powers. Then, too, how often when aroused by the keenness of my pain and fired by my love for what is good. Did I exclaim enthusiastically, I suffer bitterly. What does it matter? I welcome suffering for it makes me better. Alas, the moment was at hand when all my energy abandoned me. Not till then did I really know what it was to be unhappy. Not yet had I experienced to the full the bitterness of grief, the sharpness of mental anguish. It was my child, my eldest son, who had taught me how deeply I could love, who was to teach me these other lessons. My hand trembles as I tell the story and my tears flow while I write. I was at his bedside with his governess, watching him while he slept. His breathing was irregular and oppressed. I could not take my eyes from him. Fear entered my soul. I prayed. I implored Providence to be just. My child must not die, I kept repeating. What sin have I committed? For what offense am I being punished? My conscience reassured me. The foremost doctors in Holland were in attendance. My tears might disturb them, so I tried to be calm, to talk about my son's illness as though he were a stranger. I felt that had I been in their place, I should have found some remedy. Yet not one of them recognized the disease from which he was suffering. It was the croup. In two days he died. It was toward me that he turned his pale, wasted little face. It was I whom his lips, scarcely able to utter a sound, seemed to be calling. It was his mother's name that I saw framed on those discolored lips. And that passed with his last breath. And I survived all this. How can God allow a mother to outlive her child? Other women I know have had sons and have lost them. But they doubtless had their family with them or some friend and were comforted and cared for were relieved of at least a fraction of their despair. I was alone in the world, utterly alone with only my misfortune as companion. My husband, overcome by his own grief, threw himself at the feet of his son while I collapsed in so alarming a condition that every effort had to be made to revive me. I had uttered a piercing shriek when I saw that my son was lifeless. I lay in a swoon as motionless as though I too were dead, and yet hearing everything that went on about me, the phrase uttered by a doctor, she gives no sign of life, was perhaps what brought me back to it. The hope of death made me resign to the prospect of the hereafter. I was completely paralyzed and could not speak a word to those who wept beside my bed. My husband hastened to me, his face streaming with tears. He called my name, implored me to keep on living for his sake and to forgive him the sorrows and unfair treatment he had inflicted on me. For the first time in his life, he admitted he had done wrong. I remained insensible. No emotion stirred within me. I only thought was the prospect of a speedy death. I am about to die, I said to myself. The despair of those about me proved this. It gave me a welcome certitude of my approaching end, which comforted me and removed some of the weight of despair beneath which I was crushed. This state lasted several hours. My window was open. The mournful song of the watchman calling the hours of the night came to my ears. I cannot describe the effect it had on me. I made a movement which betrayed the fact that I was still alive, but how little I cared for that life. The following day passed, dreary and silent. I could not shed a tear. They brought me the child that was left me. I looked at him, then pushed him away. 
I do not want to love anything again on earth. I felt I was about to die, and I waited impatiently for the hour to strike. Religion might have secured me, but at that moment, I did not respond to any religious sentiment. All those emotions seemed to have been stifled in my heart. For what am I being punished? What have I done wrong? Was I not already unhappy enough? I can no longer believe in God, in his kindness, or in his justness. But if I die, then my faith in him will be restored. I exclaimed. I added a moment later, I feel he has set a limit for my sufferings. He is about to reunite me with my son. Now may his name be praised. I yearned for that moment to come. None of these thoughts changed my physical condition. My body had lost the power to move me. My eyes were always dry and with a fixed stare in them, my features unchanging and expressionless. I was no longer in communication with those about me. I showed no apparent sign of being alive. Only my inner life still continued. The doctors recommended that I should travel. I made no objections for nothing any longer affected me. It had been difficult to make me take any nourishment. A new novel that had just appeared was read aloud to me. Everything was done to distract my attention, which seemed concentrated unremittingly on a single point. The words uttered near me reached my brain, but were unable to distract my mind. I had constantly before my eyes the lifeless body of my son and was unable to shed a tear. Princess Caroline hastened to me from Paris, as well as Adele and her sister, the wife of Marshal Ney. Far from being touched by this token of their affection, I looked at them without saying a word. I knew that they were my friends, but I had ceased to care for anyone. My mother came from the Chateau of Lincoln to which I was taken. She was overcome with grief at the death of her grandson, yet found courage enough to come and nurse her daughter. In what a state she found me. Much had been hoped from our meeting. It was thought that the presence of my beloved mother would produce a beneficial emotion. On my arrival at the Palace of Lincoln, the Empress in tears rushed forward to meet me. I recognized her perfectly, looked at her, but not a word or sign indicated that I still retained a spark of affection for her. She had not conceived a condition which no remedy could cure. The sight of me filled her with alarm and grief. Dr. Corvisar declared that only the passage of time and change of scene could improve my health and that drugs would kill me. His opinion was followed, and I was surprised to hear my husband approve of it. Is it possible he agrees to something that will do me good? It is the first time he's ever done such a thing like that. If anything could have moved me, it would have been this change in Louis' attitude. That was why when he left me to return to Holland, I took his hand and said, Louis, I feel that I'm about to die. I wish to give you the assurance that I forgive you. I die as innocent as the child I have just lost. Wherever he may be, I shall be by his side. Do not grieve on my account, for I shall be happy. He begged me to take care of myself, not to give way to such sad premonitions and left the palace. My mother took me out for daily walks to visit the neighboring estates. It did not matter to me where we went. I had no preferences, no will of my own. Nevertheless, the presence of many people made me feel noticeably ill at ease. One day, we were at one of these estates. The owners paid us a thousand compliments, to which I did not reply a single word. Indeed, I felt so annoyed that I took a path that led away from that which the rest of the gathering were following. Adele looked for me and found me seated on a bench. I had been there about a quarter of an hour when I heard the notes of a hunting horn. They had an extraordinary effect on me. Till then, I had constantly felt as though some enormous weight were stifling me. My breath came in gasps like that of my poor child. I seemed to feel him gasping in my arms, and my own suffering reminded me constantly of his last moments. Suddenly, the sound of the instrument that echoed in the distance entered my very soul. The emotion it roused in me relaxed my nerves. Abundant tears flowed down my cheeks. My senses seemed to revive. But at the same time, how keen a sorrow pierced my heart. The pain was so intense that I could not bear the shock. My moral paralysis returned, checking once more all my natural faculties. And it was with a feeling of relief that I exclaimed, I am better. I cannot feel anything anymore. I suffered so dreadfully. With these words, I relapsed into my previous insensibility. I am convinced that music would have restored my nerves to their natural state, but who would have thought of to prescribe such a remedy? My brain was extremely clear. Not a detail escaped me. I was entirely conscious of my mother's grief. I understood how alarmed she was. It was painful for me not to be able to comfort her, but I had not the strength to overcome my apathy. We left for Paris. As we passed Saint-Denis, I was reminded that there lay the remains of my son. My imagination seemed to enjoy all those ideas which would increase my sorrow. I looked at my remaining child. He was pale and delicate. He needed all my care. I was about to leave him and also say farewell to my mother. This separation did not cause me a single pang. 
My departure took place without my shedding a single tear. I was taken to the Pyrenees. This trip and two spasms of pain similar to the one I had felt on hearing the hunting horn improved my health. Yet all my thoughts remained turned towards death. I considered a gift that heaven owed me and awaited with a pious resignation that instant of release whose advent I had never expected to try to hasten. When we arrived at Benier, a beautiful valley of Campan did not please me. It was too cheerful. This enchanting landscape was not in keeping with my state of mind. What I needed was stern and wild scenery in harmony with prolonged grief. Therefore, I only stayed a few days at Benier. As soon as my arrival became known, people from the neighboring towns and peasants from the surrounding country hastened to come and look at me. This curiosity reminded me of my rank, my sad fate, and my recent misfortune. My health became worse. I could not breathe, and I remained dumb. Only when I could leave my carriage on the highway and, with the dell, slip away into one of those little valleys which seemed to offer me a refuge from the world and its troubles, only then was I able to forget for a moment where I was and the misfortune that had caused me to travel so far. Adele used all her influence to recall my reason, to rouse my attention by showing me how I could do good to others. This was the surest means of touching my heart. Together we visited the hospitals, but there I found the lot of others preferable to my own. One day a poor woman came to me in tears and begged me to obtain some information regarding her son who was in the army and whom she believed dead. I looked at her with sympathy. I did what she wanted me to, but I exclaimed, she is happier than I, at least she has some hope. I gave orders that she was to be given all the money we had with us. She seemed so pleased that I sincerely envied her lot and her poverty since there was something in the world that could console her. In one of my excursions, when I was some distance away from any human habitation, I caught sight of a young man and a young girl coming down the mountainside. They stopped and we asked them some questions. I inquired if they were married. No, replied the young man, looking earnestly at his companion. I wish we were. She always tells me to come and see her at the chalet, but she will never consent to marry me. I wished to find out the reason and asked if they loved one another. If it was a question of money that prevented their union, I would undertake to remove this obstacle. I had them take me to see their parents. The young man did so reluctantly. I obliged him to act as interpreter when I spoke to his family, who only spoke the native dialect. My questions seemed to embarrass them all. They finally declared that the marriage could not take place because the father would not give his consent. Try as I might to discover the reason, I could not do so. The young man offered me milk at his cottage. I heard a child crying as the woman held it in her arms. This sight touched me and some tears still further relieved my feelings. The young peasant was no longer smiling. His expression had something sad about it. He looked at me with an air that was uncomfortable and sympathetic at the same time. When I left, I gave him some Napoleons, which at first he refused to accept. At the same time, I told him that he still had a chance to make up his mind. I was not leaving the neighborhood till two days later and I would provide the dowry if the marriage took place. The following day, while I was out walking with my entire household, Jacques, that was the young peasant's name, came up to me. He was trembling. Madame, he said, I've come to ask your pardon. I deceived you. I am already married. It so often happens that rich city folk come to our mountainside and amuse themselves at our expense. And I thought you were like that. I thought you were making fun of us poor country people. And I told you a story that was not true. The child you heard crying and which you saw in its mother's arms is, is my child. So I could not accept your gifts. But when I saw your tears and I understood that you really meant to be kind to us, I was sorry for what I had done. To deceive a woman as good as you are must be a sin. I could not sleep all night. This morning, I went to the priest. I confessed everything and relieved my conscience. He told me to come and see you to beg your pardon. I hear you are a queen and that you can have me put in prison. That doesn't matter. I feel that I had to tell you the truth. I was touched by Jacques' frankness. I complimented him on the fact that having done wrong, he knew how to make amends. One must always appreciate the rare courage it takes to admit having done wrong. The memory of this little incident has often helped me understand how greatly the pride of fashionable people hampers their force of character. The innocent conscience of this untutored peasant boy had instinctively shown him how to act, as surely as social training or intellectual brilliancy might have done. I went on to Couture, where 
the mountains crowding closer together as they increase in height make the landscape more imposing and at the same time more rugged. I liked the sound of roaring streams dashing continually past my house, for a mind haunted by the thought of death enjoys the presence of destructive forces. That was why I sought continually to approach nearer to these awful chasms. I feared to be followed by my equerries or chamberlain, whose presence would have disturbed me, and I would slip away from them. Taking Adele's arm, I would disappear down the most difficult and dangerous pathways. How often did I take delight in visiting those humble cottages, which seemed to me a refuge of happiness? How often, too, when the lateness of the hour compelled me to hurry back, did I pick my way across perilous torrents? The round, wet trunk of a tree served as my bridge. I had to place my feet crossways, one in front of the other, in order to reach the opposite side. The thunder of the rushing waters as they dashed down into an abyss on whose brink we stood might make us dizzy, but it could not alarm me. Only when I looked back would I be surprised at my own temerity and at the same time rejoice not to have seen some easy, comfortable bridge a little farther upstream because the moment of danger had for an instant taken my mind off my affliction. Who would have believed that a few years later, among other mountains, another expedition far less dangerous would cost me so dearly and cast over my life the shadow of an eternal sorrow?